The objective of this presentation is to focus on the importance of some of the variables in study design that can impact experimental outcomes when evaluating drug transporter interactions. The aspects that will be covered include probe substrate, inhibitor and assay format which are typically the core elements of any in vitro transport assay. As we go along, I will show you why these variables are important through a format of presenting a consideration or challenge, possible solutions and a case study example for each. This will be provided for efflux as well as uptake transporters and assay designs. The objective of this presentation is to focus on the importance of some of the variables in study design that can impact experimental outcomes when evaluating drug transporter interactions. The aspects that will be covered include probe substrate, inhibitor and assay format which are typically the core elements of any in vitro transport assay. As we go along, I will show you why these variables are important through a format of presenting a consideration or challenge, possible solutions and a case study example for each. This will be provided for efflux as well as uptake transporters and assay designs. So let's start with probe substrate considerations. It is well established that most probes have broad or overlapping substrate specificity. So identification of inhibition potential becomes a challenge on two counts. One, to be able to determine the specific transporter that your compound is inhibiting. And two, to obtain an accurate read of the true potency. I have an example here from our work when we were developing our BCRP inhibition assay. Cladribin is an example of a compound which like many others it is both a BCRP as well as a PGP substrate. Valspodar and KO143 which are inhibitors of PGP and BCRP respectively will both exert an effect on the transport of cladribin and reduce the efflux ratio though to different degrees. If these were your compounds how would you be able to determine which transporter your compound is inhibiting? Now possible solutions would include identifying a more specific BCRP probe substrate or the easier option which is a clean test system which, which could either be overexpressing a single transporter or one in which the expression of the transporter clouding the picture is knocked down. Our solution was to use our proprietary CPT P1 cells which have the expression of PGP knocked down while retaining the functional expression of BCRP. When cladribin is evaluated using this clean test system, we see a way to clearly discriminate a true BCRP inhibitor. We are also able to accurately determine the potency of inhibition as you see from these examples of BCRP inhibitors which were evaluated in CPTP1. If substrates have overlapping specificity, inhibitors are non-specific. At high or unoptimized concentrations, they are promiscuous and confound identification of substrate potential. We know this to be true about any number of well-known transporter inhibitors that are commonly being used. In this example, the compound appears to be a BCRP substrate since the efflux ratio in the presence of BCRP inhibitor KO143 is reduced to less than 50%. Once again, the solution could just be to try and identify a more specific inhibitor or is it possible to eliminate the inhibitor by utilizing a test system in which we remove the transporter of interest and thereby assess its contribution to the permeability of your compound. So this is what we did. We looked at the transport of this compound in our CPT B1 cells which have BCRP expression knocked down in comparison to the wild type cells and we observed no difference. When we calculated relative efflux ratio, which is the efflux ratio in the wild type cells 
over the efflux ratio in the BCRP knockdown cells, we found this to be less than 2. So the danger with the use of non-specific inhibitors is the potential for misclassification and unnecessary downstream clinical engagement which can be avoided by just using a more specific approach. Inhibitors can be more specific if their concentration is optimized, but this is substrate specific. We know this all too well from decades of work with SIP metabolizing enzymes. In much the same way, the IC50 of an inhibitor for a specific transporter depends on the substrate. This example illustrates a collaborative study we performed with the FDA to evaluate the transporter interactions of statins that culminated in a publication in DMD in 2011. In this study, we identified Rosuva statin as being a substrate of three efflux transporters, PGP, BCRP, and MRP2. When a confirmatory experiment with a panel of PGP, BCRP, and MRP2 inhibitors was performed, the lack of potency of verapamil surprised us. Verapamil was being used at 100 micromolar, which is 20-fold higher than its IC50 for digoxin. We investigated this further by titrating the concentration of verapamil until at a much higher concentration we were able to observe the expected impact on PGP. So the solution in this case can be to optimize the inhibitor concentration each time you evaluate substrate potential and obviously this is very cumbersome. The alternative again is to use as we did in this case a PGP knockdown test system. The hepatic and renal uptake transporters have been in focus since the ITC WISE paper was released that highlighted the clinical significance of these transporters. Both the EMA guidance which came out in 2010 and the new 2012 FDA draft guidance emphasize the importance of evaluating interactions with these transporters. In view of this, having validated assays to determine the substrate and inhibition potential of your compounds for these uptake transporters is critical. As any of you who may have worked to set these assays up in-house can attest to, these are challenging assays. So these are perfect examples then to highlight the importance of assay format. In our initial attempts to develop a substrate assay for the hepatic uptake transporter OATP1B1, which is my example here, we had a poor success rate and well-known substrates did not show a robust influx ratio between transfected and vector control cell lines and thereby did not score using our assay format. When we realized that preset assay conditions would not work for all compounds, we moved to an optimal matrix approach which utilizes multiple concentrations and time durations. This provides a way to factor in both test compound and transporter characteristics to ensure that we are not getting false negatives. With the example illustrated here of Pindalol, we observe the differential influx rate ratio obtained under different conditions of concentration and time. And yet while we propagate the matrix approach for definitive assessment of substrate potential, there is a requirement for an intelligent design that fulfills the need in the discovery domain. Would it be possible to have an assay format with a single concentration and time duration that can be used as a screening tool to identify liability early? To be able to do this, we have to factor the very variables that confounded us at the start, which are the properties of the compound which make it a specific substrate for a transporter and its physical chemical characteristics that determine the choice of concentration. Transporter affinity and capacity and robustness of expression in the test system provide flexibility on the time duration. So here is some simplified retrospective analysis to see how OCT2 substrates score. It may be possible from looking at this data that a single concentration and single duration screening assay could potentially be performed that would score the majority of compounds accurately. One of the issues with an uptake format is the requirement to perform this discrete for each of the multiple time du durations. We have to assign cells for each duration which are lysed and from which compound is extracted. 
since we don't know the sink conditions for the compound. The directional assay does not have this issue since we can look at transport at multiple time durations for the same monolayer of cells. But is this assay format foolproof? If we were to assess Rosuva statin in the MDR1 MDCK cell line, we would conclude this was not a PGP substrate. But in a double transfected cell line which expresses both uptake and efflux transport systems, the involvement of both OATP1B1 and PGP become evident. Bidirectional permeability and cell accumulation data in this double transfected cell line and other results from a comparison to show that there can be disagreement and different outcomes depending on the test systems and assay formats that are used was part of a poster that we presented at AAPS and is the data that we're showing on this slide. In conclusion, it is clear that design variables can impact experimental outcomes. What is not clear is why we're all thinking that the results from one assay and test system may be sufficient to conclude on substrate or inhibition potential of a compound for a given transporter. We understand there is conflict and this is because of the limitations that are inherent to certain test systems or reagents. An understanding of these variables should result in the incorporation of improved assay design and or utilization of better tools to elucidate transporter interactions. More importantly, we should consider the approach as we do, for example, with SIP substrate assessment, where at least two of three tests are recommended to confirm the results and apply this to our assessment of these complex drug transporter interactions to avoid misclassifications and unnecessary downstream clinical engagement.